Greetings, everyone. This is Fred Coulter. Welcome to Church at Home. Church at Home is sponsored by the Christian Biblical Church of God, and we are dedicated to restoring original Christianity for today, the truth of God. What is the finished work of Christ? Before we understand what the finished work of Christ is, we need to understand, as we saw, who was he? And we saw that he was God, that he was creator. And nothing came into existence that he didn't create. He was the one who said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He was the one who inspired King David to write that man was made a little lower than God. That's why we're made in the image of God. But the truth of the matter is, this was done so that God could become a man. So let's read how that was done. That's a tremendous thing to understand. The Creator who created all human beings came to this earth and was born as any other human being. So let's come to Philippians, the second chapter, and let's see how Paul describes that this was done. Verse 6, who, although he existed in the form of God, and that means he was God, just like we read in the last segment there, that the word was God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself. So he gave up. What did he give up? He gave up nearly all of his eternal life. He gave up his glory. He gave up his position. He gave up his power. Now notice, and was made in the likeness of of men, and took the form of a servant, which is in the Greek, doulos, which means a slave. He didn't come as a high and mighty person. He didn't come with great fanfare and trumpets and great announcements. He came as an ordinary infant. the divine conception. So that means he had to divest himself of all of his life as God to become a pinpoint of life to be impregnated in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And he had to have complete, absolute faith and trust in God the Father. That he would do this. So let's come to Luke, the first chapter, and let's see how that came about. Now, during what the world calls Christmas time, they focus in on the birth of Christ for about 10 or 15 minutes and then run off and do everything that they want to do themselves. But you need our book, A Harmony of the Gospels, and that will show you when he was born. And he was born right on time. And that had to be in order to fulfill the prophecies. And he was not born on December 25th. You get to Harmony of the Gospels, you will see he was born on the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month of the calculated Hebrew calendar. Now, if that sounds strange to you, then that tells you how much you're missing. Do you really want to know the truth? They get the harmony of the Gospels. Now, Luke, the first chapter, verse 26. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the lineage of David, and the name of the virgin was Mary. 
And after coming to her, the angel said, Hail, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was greatly perplexed. What is this? Now notice, it was in Nazareth. And that was in the area of Galilee, not in Jerusalem. And I want you to think on that for just a minute. And she was considering what kind of salutation this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found grace with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of David his forefather, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob into the ages, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Boy, that tells you a lot. There's a lot of work to finish what Christ is going to do, correct? Going clear on into the ages of eternity. So Mary said to the angel, How shall this be? since I've not had sexual relations with a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Little sidebar right here. The Holy Spirit is the power of God, here rightly defined. Not a third God in a trinity. So if you believe... In a trinity, you believe in an error because the Bible does not teach it regardless of how men twist the scriptures to make it seem so. So I'd like to give all of you a priestly blessing with this symbol of love. It's Jesus who hung on the cross for love of you and for me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For this reason, the Holy One being begotten in you shall be called the Son of God. Begotten right at the instant that the angel was speaking to her. That's part of the work of Christ. Because never will it be said to God, Why, you were never a human being. You were never born like me. And all the things that we suffered through, you don't understand because you never were a person. So he came to be that perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. But he had to grow up. And he had to have a proper mother and a proper stepfather so that he would be watched over, cared for, and I'm sure there are always a lot of angels around at hand. And remember, after he was born and the wise men came to present their gifts to the house where they were at that time in Bethlehem, and just a little sidebar. Isn't it interesting how he came to be born in Bethlehem when they were living in Nazareth? God caused a tax to be given in the whole empire, and everyone had to return to his home city to register. And that's where Joseph was from. And guess what? When they came, there was no place in any of the inns because it was leading to the Feast of Tabernacles and Feast of Trumpets was going to be right at hand. So Jesus, who was God, immortal before he divested himself of his divinity to become a pinpoint of life, to be begotten in the womb of Virgin Mary, was born in a stable. And 
Joseph probably had to deliver the baby. It says nothing of other women in attendance. And he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. Now you think about that, about how great important people like great recognition to lift up the greatness of the person. But look what God did and how humble he was. And this was all part of the work of Christ, of his ministry. Think of what would happen if Joseph and Mary had not had to come to Bethlehem to register for the tax. Think if he would have been born in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden it was announced, this is the king of the Jews. Oh, Herod would have went out and killed him immediately, right? So that's why it was done the way that it was done. And to whom was the announcement given? to shepherd boys out in the field watching the sheep, which also shows it wasn't in the middle of the winter. And they came and found that it was so. And they went around and said it was so. But none of the officials, the priests, the elders, Herod, knew anything about it. Now, when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem to keep the Passover, and Jesus went up with them. And after it was all over and everybody had left, Jesus stayed back. And they suppose that Jesus was in amongst the whole group of those going back to Bethlehem from Jerusalem to Galilee, but then they discovered he wasn't there, and Joseph and Mary went back to find Jesus, and after three days, they found him. And where was he? He was in the temple, and in the midst of the teachers. Luke 2 and verse 46, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing them and questioning them. And all those who were listening to him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But when they saw them, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you dealt with us in this manner? Look, your father and I have been very distressed searching for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Don't you realize that I must be about my father's business? But they didn't understand it. Now let's look at a prophecy in the book of Isaiah, which fills in with the work of Christ. How was he taught? How was, did he learn the things of God and the word of God and the Bible and so forth? Huh? How did that happen? Well, let's come to Isaiah 50. Here is a prophecy, and this is part of getting Jesus ready for the work of his ministry. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned to know to help the weary with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as one being taught. So the father woke Jesus up in the morning and taught him every day. The angels were there guarding him, watching over him. And when he was 12, then he came to the temple and he had all of this knowledge. Yet he wasn't learning in their synagogue. He wasn't learning in their theological seminaries, if you could put it that way. He was being taught directly by God the Father. Now notice verse 5, And the Lord opened my ear, and I was not rebellious nor turned away backwards. Now let's jump ahead just a little bit and see how some of these prophecies in the Old Testament work. A little here, a little there, a line here, a precept here. 
Now notice verse 6 in Isaiah 50, it goes straight from there to his scourging just before he died on the cross. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced on account of this. I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. So, that shows from birth to the end. And remember what we read in, in Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. All right? So the important thing is, Jesus was God manifested in the flesh for the very purpose of becoming the Savior of all mankind. And so that through his sacrifice, we can have our sins forgiven. And that is the work that he says there in John 17, I have finished the work that you have given me. That's all the ministry. That's the first part. And then when he was on the cross, he says, it is finished. Everything about the life and ministry of Christ. That was necessary for us. Now, because of that, we need to understand that God has done a great and marvelous thing through that. And that demonstrates his love because it says there in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him may not perish but may have everlasting life. That's the whole purpose of it, and that's why he had to be resurrected. Now, let's see what the apostles preached and Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given, because now it gets down to, since God has done this for us, and you need the harmony of the gospel so you can read everything that Jesus went through, willingly, volunteered, gave his life for everyone who will believe in him and his sacrifice and repent and quit sinning. Now, why is that so important? Because he died for the sins of the world. And that is called in John, the first chapter, the sin of the world. And that sin is the sin of lawlessness and human nature that we all have, which comes from the sin of Adam and Eve and Satan, the devil. And that's what we're being saved from. So the work of God continues. He's working in heaven at the right hand of God right now to call people to repentance. And what about you? Will you repent? And will you understand that sin is a transgression of the law? And will you understand that you have to live in God's way, his truth, his laws, his commandments, and not of the world? And let's see what Peter said here, because it expands from this to the whole world. Acts 2 Verse 36, let all the house of Israel know with full assurance. So you need to understand that and apply this to yourself. That God has made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now notice how they reacted and responded. Will you react this way? Will you respond this way? Will you repent to God? They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And that's why we have the book, Lord, what shall I do? How do you come out of this world? How do you come to the knowledge of God? Through the truth, through the Holy Spirit of God. But you must repent first and you must be baptized as Peter says right here. 
Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and your children, and to all those who are far off, as many as the Lord God may call. Now, the call of God is going out now. How will you respond? Will you repent? Because we're going to see the work of God continues. And the work of God is working in those who have the Spirit of God. And you need to understand that. Now, if you have not repented, and you need to repent, and you do repent, let us know, because we have a good number of elders, and you can be baptized properly. And we've got a booklet. What is the true meaning of water baptism? It is a wonderful thing for you to understand and why it is necessary. And all of that's the continuing work of God. Now, what is called the preaching of the gospel is also the work of God going out in truth, in love, in power, in understanding. And that's why we have the things that we have for you, so that you can learn, you can change, you can grow, you can overcome. Let's see this. Let's come to Ephesians, the second chapter. And let's see where we all start, because this is how we are. If we're living in our sins, we're spiritually dead. So Paul is referring to that in verse 1. Now you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you walked in time past according to the course of this world. That's the way of the world. That's not the way of God. And the way of the world is guided and directed by Satan and the devil, who is deceiving the whole world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working within the children of disobedience. If you're not keeping the commandments of God, you are a child of disobedience. And that's why your life is upside down and backwards. And that's why you don't know God. And that's why we do what we do and preach what we preach so you can know, so you can understand. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive with Christ, for you have been saved by grace. And grace is the grace and favor from God. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is especially not of your own works. It is the gift of God. Now let's see what kind of works that we should not have and what kind of works we should have. Not of works by saying, oh, we did this, we did that, we did the other thing, so that no one may boast. Now notice, here is the continuing work now of God the Father and Jesus Christ. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. That is developing the new mind, the new heart, the new person, the new man, the new woman. Created in Christ Jesus. Now notice, unto the good works that God ordained beforehand in order that we might walk in them. Now stop and think about this for a minute. We are judged by our works. You read Revelation 2 and 3, and Christ says, I know your works, because we're judged by our godly works. That's what this verse is telling us. What are the godly works? Well, it begins with the Spirit of God and having the laws and commandments of God written in our hearts and in our minds. That is the conversion so that we are being 
transformed by the renewing of our minds. That also is the continuing work of God the Father and Jesus Christ. So the finished work of God or the finished work of Christ is only a portion of part of it that has been completed. It is ongoing. And that's what you need to understand. And within that ongoing works, you are to have the works of God. Whereas before, you had your own works, your own way, your own righteousness, your own religion. Now, you've got to come to God and forsake all of those things that you have done in the flesh and have them buried in the the watery grave of baptism. So you get our two books. Lord, what should I do? And Harmony of the Gospels, The Life of Jesus Christ. And that will give you the basic teachings and the whole outlay of the life of Christ, that he was God before he became man, and all about his preaching and teaching and of the apostles and of his death and crucifixion and resurrection, all a part of the work of God. And the work of God, remember, is always continuing. So be sure to go to our other website, truthofgod.org, and there we have many detailed sermons and messages to help answer questions. There we've got a whole series on grace, a whole series on love, a whole series on the keys to answered prayer to help you so that you can come to Christ and be able to obtain eternal life. So until next time, This is Fred Calder saying, so long, everyone.